How many uh, designers, developers? Designers, raise your hands. One, okay, <laughs> good, <laughs> great, great. Uh, so my name's Aaron Kaufman, I'm from Cleveland. Uh, I'm the lead product designer at a company called Prototype One. So we do, we're a software consulting firm uh, in the Cleveland area. Um, today is going to be interesting. Uh, you're gonna learn why I went bald. <laughs> uh, but before I uh, really delve into the, uh, the management of you know, anxiety and depression and the, the mental breakdown, I wanted to kind of take you through uh, a moment I had in 2015, and it was in March, and I would wake up, probably happened about three times, with just intense stomach pain. About 2 a.m. consistently, again, three, four times a month, cringing, keel, like keeled over, not sure what was going on, thought it was food poisoning, thought I just had some weird GI issue. And I went to a doctor who's a buddy of mine and I said, look, I've got this stomach pain and I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, and he's like, well, we can do some blood work and you know, we'll send you to a, a GI doctor and we can figure this out. But he's like, let me ask you something. How are you feeling? Uh, obviously terrible. I've got stomach pain. I don't know why. And he said, no, I mean, how are you feeling mentally? I said, well, I mean, I've had a, a pretty terrible year. Uh, a lot of stressful things have happened. So, you know, I'm not excited about a lot of things and I, I guess I'm just okay. He's like, what are your thoughts on going to talk to somebody, like a therapist? And uh, I said, I, I don't need a therapist. I'm perfectly fine. I just have this stomach problem. And he's like, and, well, the stomach problem might be actually linked to your, you know, what you claim is, you know, mild depression. Uh, it might be linked to that. And he was right. I went to a therapist, I was put on anti-anxiety medication, and the stomach problems went away instantaneously. And I learned that your stomach reacts to your brain in stressful situations. You've heard of flight or fight? That's exactly what happens with your stomach. It reacts in that, in that same fashion. So the anti-anxiety medication was just a Band-Aid. There's a, a systemic problem and it needed to be fixed and obviously that's why I'm here with you today. But I wanna jump back so that you better understand who I am, how I'm wired and you can start to see the patterns that emerged as I, uh, as I went through my career. So in August 2009, I graduated from Kent State University with a degree in VCD, which sounds like a venereal disease but that's just Visual communication design, fancy way of saying graphic design. That's what we designers do. Uh, and I noticed within the first month of graduating, I was working part time at this ad agency. I wasn't busy. I had like two, three days of work and then I'd go home and I'd be like, okay, what now? And it started eating away at me. And I started noticing that I was getting a little depressed, just strange. Because before college, I was as lazy as you could imagine. Uh, I, when I had hair, it was super long. <laughs> I didn't like haircuts. I play a lot of video games. In fact, the only reason that I went to Kent State was because I didn't have to fill out a college essay. I actually wanted to go to OSU, but they required the college essay, so I went to Kent State instead. Uh, it worked out. Kent State's a great design program. But uh, the, that, was, that was my mentality. And then something happened. Something happened in college where I became this workaholic. And I don't know if it was beaten into me through the design program or if it was just something that the, the wires tripped up. But I became depressed when I, when I didn't have that thing to keep me busy. Well, that quickly changed in November. So just a few months later, I landed my first full-time job in an IT company, and I was set out to start the marketing, web design, and development portion 
of this, this small IT firm. And it would, I went from basically not being busy at all to working 80 plus hours a week, uh, managing designers and developers, and I'm like 22 at the time. So it was extremely demanding. And I was working with a lot of financial firms, and I was starting to get bored. I was designing a lot of Flash websites back when Flash was cool, uh, and I, I was starting to get bored. So I started freelancing, and this was the first like professional website I had for myself. And there's like so many textures layered on top of each other. That logo was animated. Uh, I had a buddy of mine <laughs> help me with it, and I started I started freelancing. And the CEO of the company, this IT firm, found out and didn't like it. I didn't have a non-compete. I didn't have anything that said I couldn't do this, but he didn't like it. And tensions started to brew, and, and we basically had a falling out, and I had to choose. Am I, am I going to stay at this company and give up freelancing, or am I, or am I going to set out and, and do my own thing? And I said, uh, screw the man. I'm going to freelance. And in November of 2012, that's exactly what I did. Uh, I started freelancing. So I left my cushy job with making lots of money to making no money, downsizing my apartment, selling my car uh, for a cheaper, cheaper vehicle, uh, picked up a roommate, complete life change. And I found that. Uh, while I was freelancing, I started getting more nonprofits on board because I was priced right. So I started getting more nonprofits. And I really enjoyed doing the work for the nonprofits. And I said, OK, maybe there's something here. Maybe if I brand myself as a creative philanthropist, uh, I, can, I can do something with that. And that, that'll be my shtick. That'll be my thing that, that gets me through and get, keeps getting me clients. So that same month, uh, I received this text from a really good friend of mine, Sarah. And she wanted me to design her a birthday card. And I had like five days to do it. And so that's usually what happens when you're a designer. People ask you to do, do things, like design them birthday cards for whatever reason. So I said, OK. I was not a fan of the idea at first, but I said, OK, because I'm a nice guy. Friday night rolls around. I still hadn't designed the card. Her birthday was the next day. And she just happened to send me a picture of her dog. And it, is, it looks like a cartoon. I mean, this, this, I've met this dog. It sits on a couch like a human. And it's like way too big to do that. So it's just awkward. And it's got these big eyes. And I don't know. Something clicked. When I saw the dog, I said, oh. I'm going to design the card around the dog, because I'm always joking about how much I like the dog more than Sarah. So I did. This was the very first dog drawing I had ever done. And I probably spent 10 minutes on this card, doodled the dog real quick, just put some you know, cute messaging. It says, oh, happy birthday, Sarah, if you can't read that at the bottom. And she loved it. And when I say she loved it, I mean she loved it. Like she went nuts when she saw the saw this illustration. She posted it on Facebook, on her on her uh, different social media accounts. And I mean there wasn't like a big like, oh my God, these are this drawing is amazing. But it was it was her response that triggered something in me. And I said, okay, you know what? Maybe maybe there's something to this. So that same month, I said, let me draw some more of these these dogs and, and uh, see if I can kind of replicate the style. So this, these were the first four dogs that I drew after Chesney. And you'll notice that I have the collar on them. I started already developing a brand because I was, I, I was thinking in my head, OK, creative philanthropy, what can I do with this? So I drew some more. <laughs> uh, and. To date, I've drawn about 1,000 of these dogs, but uh, this was the first batch. And I had fun doing it. They, were, they, were, they took me between 15, 20 minutes each. Uh, I got faster over time. Uh, and I, I said, OK, this might be the project to get, to get my name out there. 
if I take these dogs and I post them somewhere, and if I, especially if I keep getting responses like I did from Sarah, from other people, maybe this is, maybe this is a, a fun little hobby that I can turn into, to, into something a little bit bigger. So in January of 2013, so a month later, so I come up with this idea in a month, drew some dogs, and then decided I was gonna create a, and launch a website. So I needed a brand, and I came up with Charity Pups. And the idea of Charity Pups was simple. I was going to use it as a tool to get my name out there as a designer, and I was going to use it to foster my creative philanthropy brand. So the idea was I'd post the dogs, you would buy a print, and then 30% of the profit would go to a different dog-related charity each month. So this was the first incarnation of the, the website. Uh, it was a form, and there was a home page where I listed all the dogs, but this, was, this is where people wanted to go. Because the idea was you go to this, this form, you fill out your dog information, your name, whatever, you upload some photos, and then I, you'd get added to a list, and I would then choose what dogs I would draw. I would post them to the site, and then you could buy, I called it Adopt-A-Print, super adorable. You could adopt a print for $25, and then 30% of that would go to a charity, and you'd feel really good. Uh, well, the problem was that this list quickly grew. As you can imagine, when you're drawing something for free, people are going to obviously want it, and then they don't have to buy it, so they'll take the digital il illustration if they're like, ah, I don't want to pay 25 bu bucks, and then they'll post that on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and then drive more people to my site. So the, the wait list quickly grew to about 300 people, and I said, I can't do this anymore. This is, I can't keep up with the demand. So I turned it into a commission-based system. And this is the current website now, as it lives. So instead of drawing for free, I said, okay, you have to pay me up front, and then I'll draw the dogs. But what I didn't do was make the mental transition from turning something that was a fun side project, a hobby, into an actual business. It was still running under my Aaron Kaufman LLC business, super creative business name, but it was still running under that business name. It wasn't Charity Pups Inc. It wasn't Charity Pups LLC. It was still under my business. And I never made that transition. In fact, I made some assumptions about the brand that created an inefficiencies. I assumed that everybody wanted custom everything. So I would print out my own chipboard uh, mailer inserts. I would hand sign them, and then you can't see on this one, but I would write little thank you messages on each order. So I was printing them out, and then I would hand sign in cursive, because that was part of the brand, I would hand sign in pink pen the name, and then I would write the address, and I'd put this little sticker that I printed, again, myself, of a pug holding a do not bend sign for the USPS so they wouldn't bend my packages, not that really, that really stopped them, but occasionally it helped. Uh, and then I, I even ordered a custom stamp that, I would, that included the brand name. So I was doing all of these things because I assumed that, that people wanted this customization, that this, this hand quality. Which, by the way, the drawings are all done digitally through Adobe Illustrator and a Wacom tablet. They're not even hand drawn. But I, I put in this perception in my head that, they, that you needed this customization, which resulted in inefficiencies because I'm printing and packaging everything. Not only that, my designer ego came into play. So suddenly, I'm saying, okay, I have to have custom packaging, but you know what's gonna make these more valuable? If I hand sign and number them. So I hand signed and numbered every single print. And it wasn't a big deal at first when you know, I was getting five orders a month or, or whatever. It was fun and you know, I, I thought people appreciated it. I never actually got feedback. Shame on me being a product designer now. But, uh, I thought that was great, and you know things started ramping up a little bit, but I was distracted 
because I had an awesome fan base. I used social media to promote Charity Pups. That was the only marketing I did, was just posting the pictures or having people post them for me. And so I became addicted to this idea of posting a dog illustration and getting that instant gratification. And so I had people like this that would replicate my style on a chalkboard or I had someone actually take my illustration and go to a tattoo parlor and get the, the design tattooed and filled in. Or this grumpy dog sitting next to the, the print. So I would have people send in the, the pictures of their dogs next to the prints. And this is a, a favorite of mine. It's an illustration of me from somebody uh, for my birthday. They decided to do that. I, it looks like I have pubic hair all over my face. <laughs> They were generous on the hair, I, I'll give them that. So this is like July 2013 was about seven months after I had launched Charity Pups. I'm still freelancing, but I'm starting to feel that, that anxiety. Like I'm not busy enough. Like Charity Pups isn't taking off. It's, you know, it's a steady plateau. And I, I had this job opportunity just kind of fall into my lap at a nonprofit, so I took it. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work as a web designer for you guys, and I'll get that, that salary. It was salaried part-time. So I got the benefits of having a stable paycheck while still being able to freelance. Well, you're going to start to see a pattern. A month later, after I just started this job, uh, I had spilled water on my pants, and I took a photo of it and post it on Instagram. I don't know why, I just, again, that addiction to getting that instant gratification. So I posted this photo like, oh man, I spilled water on my pants. And uh, I was reading through the comments, and this person at the bottom uh, chose this photo, I don't know why to this day, still don't know why, but she chose this photo to, to ask me to draw her dog Finn. In a lot of instances, I usually would ignore people that would do this because it's like, just go to the website but I decided to click on her name, and it was Amanda Seyfried, and I don't know if you know who she is. She's an actress, uh, Mean Girls. She's the one that can tell the weather with her boobs at the end. I don't know if that rings a bell. But at the time, she had like 300,000 followers, and I was like, there's no way this is her. So I went online and confirmed it, and I was like, oh my god, this is actually her. Yes, I will draw your dog. Please email me immediately. And she did, and uh, we hit it off. Um, you know, we just went through a divorce. I'm just kidding. Uh, the, so she, she was awesome. She agreed to uh, send me some photos of her with Finn and the print so that I could use them as promotional material. She even tweeted support for Charity Pups, which uh, actually ended up in the tabloids. So there's actually, if you do a, a Google search for Charity Pups and Amanda Seyfried, you'll see uh, Amanda Seyfried tweets support for Charity Pups. It's the only time I'll ever be in the tabloids, but uh, pretty cool. And so I got this little spike, my 15 minutes of fame. And of course, I, I was bragging to everybody about how she, she reached out to me and I drew her dog. So that kind of steadied out. And about a year later, I was bored again. I was getting that itch. Uh, I realized that freelancing full-time wasn't my thing. I was still doing it on the side, but it, it wasn't my thing. And uh, I had an opportunity to work at uh, one of the world's largest audio, uh, B2B audiobook companies as the interactive art director. And I thought, okay, this is great. You know, this is going to push me a little bit further in my career, um, and I, I'm going to take the opportunity. And this was full-time. So naturally, a month later, <laughs> I received this email from Good Housekeeping Magazine. And I didn't know what Good Housekeeping Magazine was, and I don't know if, I'm going to assume some of you don't know what it is, but it's a very big, popular national magazine uh, for typically, I may be insulting some people here, typically the target market is middle-aged women. Uh, I'm sorry if you're younger and you read it, but that's their typical audience. Uh, and so they, they reached out to me and asked to talk to my PR contact, which was like really flattering. So I thought about making up a fake PR contact email. And I was like, no, that's, that's not the Charity Pups way. So I, 
I agreed. I said, like, yeah, let me send you my, my stuff. And I was like, there's no way they're going to accept me. I'm just like a one-man shop. But they didn't know that. And um, they pitched it to their editor-in-chief. And they loved it. And they said, awesome, you're going to be in our, our gift list issue. I was like, cool. So November 2014, so we're a few months now later, the issue hits the shelf. This is what it looks like. Now, I want to point out something really important here. That number 50, 50 gifts, 50. They didn't tell me that there were only 50 gifts featured in this issue. Their holiday gift issue had 50 gifts featured, and I was one of 50. So my fiance was like, I told you. It's going to be a big thing you're going to get. Because I was like, I'm not going to get that many orders. I'm going to be buried within like hundreds of products. Nope. And you can see on this side, this is the actual spread of where I was featured. Um, I'm under freaking PetSmart. And there's only three pet items. And I'm the, the only one that has, offers custom dog drawings. So of course, people are going to jump on that. That's exactly what happened. Uh, I, I'd like to say that I was able to manage the influx of orders on top of my full-time job, but I would watch them come in and stack up. And the first day was really awesome. I was like, oh my god, I have so many orders. And then day two came, and I was like, oh my god, I have so many orders. And then day three came, and I started panicking. This is when the anxiety started really hitting me. Uh, and in November and December of 2014, I drew over 400 dogs. So this GIF is not 400 of those dogs. There's no way it would load. Uh, but I drew 400 dogs on top of my job as an interactive art director. So I would go home, and then I would spend another six hours drawing dogs, go to bed, wake up, go to my full-time job, and repeat, and spend my weekends doing this. It got to a point where I literally couldn't handle it. Uh, anymore. And so, just a quick flashback. Do we remember when I uh, made the assumption that everything had to be custom? Okay, well, that really sucked here. Because take 400 dogs and now multiply it by all of the things that I made custom. That's a lot of work. And so I started like recruiting people. I had an assembly line of people packaging and printing and and uh, signing and, uh, oh no, I had to do the signing, but like signing the, the envelopes, I had to sign all 400 of the prints because again, I put value in that and I was like, I can't just not sign them anymore. What if someone from Wisconsin compares their print to someone in Ohio and they see one is signed and one isn't? So this was, this was my life for, uh, I, I, this isn't, this isn't staged. I wish it was. My fiance snapped this photo of me when I wasn't paying attention, clearly. And uh, this was my life. This is what I was doing. And I was running on pure adrenaline at this point. I was eating like crap. And I was neglecting relationships. Thank God my, my Stacy, I'm just going to call her Stacy now. That's my fiance. Stacy was so accommodating, and that's partially because she's an internal medicine resident. Uh, so she understands what hard work is and, and what it means to accomplish something. So she, was, she stuck with me uh, and even offered to help uh, where she could. But February rolled around. So we're, we're after the holiday season now. Now, one thing that's important to note is I did hit a point where I literally could not handle any more uh, orders because I had a two-week turnaround time, and I said, if I get any more orders, there's no way, because I knew how long it took me to draw the dogs. I could only draw X amount per month. And I knew that at a certain point, there was just, there's just no, no more uh, capacity to do this. So I had closed the store down, but offered an email sign up to find out when the store would reopen. And that list grew to 1,000 people. <laughs> so here we are after the holiday season, and I'm like, all right, cool, I survived. The adrenaline is starting to, to calm down. 
And I, I start to reopen the store in January, just in spurts. I had to close it a few times. I ended up drawing 80 more dogs in January. Uh, and that's when February happened. And that's when I completely just crashed. Because when you're in the moment, when you're in that like re fight or flight moment, all you're doing is fighting. You're fighting against the, the, the desire to, to run away and say, I don't want to do this anymore. So this is kind of a recap of what happened. The, the 15 minutes of fame, that's Amanda, my boo. Then the what's, the what's happening, that's good housekeeping. okay. And then that, that pink line, that's success. So that, when I hit that pink line, that's the moment, that, that day when I got my first batch of orders in from the good housekeeping uh, uh, influx, and I was like, yes, this is freaking awesome. And then day two, day three, day four, when it keeps happening, that's when I'm going, shit, 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 up to the top, and then I start going into react mode, where I'm just going and going and going and going, trying to survive this, this craziness. Well, what happens is when you shut the store down, and you have time to start like controlling orders, you go, I hate this project so much, I never want to draw another damn dog ever again. You can't tell anybody that because you're the guy that draws dogs without actually owning a dog, just a side note. Uh, and then when you drop down past that line of success, when things start to slow down, something weird happens. You start to say, this project is now failing. And you know why. It's because you said, I can't handle this. But that causes a lot of weird things to start happening in your brain. Because when the project starts to fail, you get to a very low point where it becomes, I'm a failure. And I want to like, let you think about that for a section, second. When the project starts to fail, it could turn into, I'm a failure. That's a terrible place to be. Something that started as a fun side project turned into me being a failure. Something that brought joy to people that I would do for free in the beginning turned into, I'm a failure. And it's really simple. I never asked this question, what if I succeed? We always ask ourselves, what if I fail? What, like, what's going to happen if the project fails? Whether it's at your, your day job, whether it's a project that you're doing for fun, whatever. What if I succeed? I never asked myself. It was always, I was always so worried. I was always so self-conscious about charity pups, the people not liking the illustrations. I was worried about the custom packaging being perfect. By the way, I was a C student throughout Kent State in illustration. I almost didn't pass because I was so bad at illustration. And that, that kind of beat me down to a point where I didn't have the confidence to say, you know what, I'm going to make this a business. I'm going to charge X amount, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to crush it. No, I went the opposite way. I said, well, see if people like it, and if they like my illustrations, I'll just keep doing them. So I never made that connection of what if I succeed? What if I get into Good Housekeeping magazine? How does the business scale? Because it was now a business, and I never mentally made that switch. So today, recently, I've done a lot of reflecting. And I've provided some of that reflection throughout this presentation so far. Uh, but I want to kind of stress a few things. One, anxiety and depression, they're not weaknesses. Weaknesses, They're not. They're obstacles. There's something that you have to overcome or work around. But they're not weaknesses. And I guarantee that there's a percentage of, this, of people in this room that are anxious or depressed. And they're not going to tell anybody. That's OK. That's your business. I'm up here announcing it to the world. And I, I admit that I was a little reluctant at first. Do I really want to put 
my name on a, on a presentation called Managing a Mental Breakdown. How is that going to impact my, uh, my you know, future jobs? And I understand that there's this, this stigma around it, but they're not weaknesses. And we all can experience it. I tend to be wired toward it, always feeling this need to be busy. And maybe some of you are the same way. And I'll talk about some tools that, that might help with that. But it, it, do, it doesn't matter. You might be in, a, in the middle of a project at work. And it's a seven month long project. And all of a sudden, things start to ramp up. And you're working 60 hours a week, maybe 70 hours a week. Maybe you're giving your weekends up. And maybe you're starting to develop that that weird, anxious feeling. And maybe it won't last. Maybe you'll be one of the lucky ones, and it just goes away when the project ends. But maybe it'll linger. And that's what happened with Charity Pups, is while Charity Pups, it didn't completely fail, because it still exists, but it got to a point where I just stopped caring about it. But the, the not caring about it and bringing it back to a scalable level, still, the anxiety lingers. To this day, I'm still battling it. Stop feeling guilty. If you are someone with anxiety and depression, stop feeling guilty about it. If you don't want to go out with your friends to grab a drink because you just came back from a crazy day at the office and you're feeling uptight and anxious and whatever, don't feel guilty about not being social. You're suffering from anxiety and depression. It's time to be a little bit selfish, right? The reason you're probably anxious and anxiety leads to depression, maybe you're depressed, is because you probably put everything into this project or into this thing. And now it's time to, to take a little bit back for yourself. And I fought hard with this one because I always felt guilty, like telling, my, telling Stacy, I, you know, I don't really want to go out tonight. Like, oh man, I don't want her to think I'm you know, boring or whatever, but it's OK. Stop feeling guilty. This is a big one, reboot your life. And we're going to talk a little bit about this one. What does it mean to reboot your life? If you have computer problems and you call your IT guy, although you're all smart people, you probably know this trick yourself, what are they going to tell you when you're saying, oh, I'm having these issues on my computer? Did you try restarting the computer? What's the difference? Our brains are computers. And sometimes we're running 1,000 miles per hour, and we hit that wall. And we start to freak out. And everything's circling around us so fast. And sometimes you need to take a step back and say, is it time to reboot my life? So what does that mean? Is it your job? OK, so remember I, worked, I was working full time at this interactive uh, or this uh, audiobook company as the interactive art director. Obviously, I don't work there anymore. I work uh, at Prototype One. But when I was there, it was awesome. Great culture, fun people, cool projects. But I was in a lot of therapy sessions, and a lot of my conversations with the therapists were about pe my managers or people I worked with. But I didn't really think too much about it until I left the job. And I started looking back. And I said, wait a minute. The culture was great. I had made friends. But I was going home at night, and I was feeling tense. You know that feeling when your stomach is like kind of like cramping up, it's like squeezing in on itself? It's kind of what, what I described at the, the beginning of the presentation. That's what I was feeling. I had knots in my stomach. Like a relationship with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Seems great at the time, but then you break up, and you're like, wow, that kind of sucked. Is your job that situation? Have you not realized it yet? Are you just continually being complacent and going to this place every day just to collect a paycheck? 
just because you like one aspect of it. I assure you that there are better options out there. Because believe me, I had put in a month's notice because I respected the company so much, I'd put in four week, a four-week notice, plus I had given them like three months ahead, ahead of time that I was probably going to be leaving the company. And they kept reminding me, you're not going to find a job like this. We know you got to leave, but you're not going to find a job like this. The culture is so good. And I said, okay. And that really sticks in your head. Like, you start to believe it. And <laughs> I'm not there anymore, I can tell you. It was great but I found something better. And I think you know, if you're in that situation, you can too. You just have to have a little bit of confidence. So let's get into something a little bit more tactical. Uh, this is called One Big Thing. And I, I don't get, I'm not getting paid for the apps that I'm presenting. I'm just, these are things that I use or I know people that use. Uh, but I use this one. And it was a concept by John Zeratsky who's a partner at Google Ventures. He's like the king of, of productivity and coming up with efficient, uh, things to make himself more efficient. And he would experiment with lists, lists of things he had to accomplish. And he found that nothing was really working. Because what happens is you create your list, and how many things do you actually cross off at the end of the day? 50% of the list, if you're lucky. And then you're looking at the rest of the list, you're like, oh my god, I have so much to do, and I haven't finished it, and oh, this is the worst thing ever. Well, he found a solution for this. And the idea was one big thing. Because he realized, and like studies have shown, that you really have about four hours at max of really productive time when you get into the flow of things during a day. And so to, taking that time and breaking it up is essential. So you start with one big thing. What's the big thing you're going to accomplish for the day? And then you have three medium things. Maybe, it's, maybe if you get backlogged with email because you're in a managerial position, maybe it's just getting through your email inbox. Maybe it's reading a chapter of a book. And then you can have your smaller things. But what's so great about this especially with people with my personality type, where they always feel like they have to be busy, or they feel guilty when they're not uh, doing something that is deemed as productive, is when you cross off that big thing, you are giving yourself permission to just relax. So maybe you want to watch the latest episode of Game of Thrones, but you don't want to start it because you're like, ah, oh, I've got all these things on my list. One big thing, crossed off the list, Go watch your episode of Game of Thrones. So big proponent of this concept. He did it on sticky notes. Someone made an app for it. Whatever works for you. Meditation. Oh, it sounds so cheesy when I say it out loud. Uh, I, <laughs> I was not. It took me months to, to finally say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start meditating. Uh, I'm not. I don't work out. Uh, I'm not a very active person. Um, I'm very good at growing a beard. That's about it. Uh, but I said, there, maybe there's something to this meditation thing everybody keeps talking about. So I downloaded the app Headspace. It's the one I like to use. You can probably find things on YouTube, audiobooks, whatever. And I've committed 10 minutes each morning before my first cup of coffee to meditate. And it wa the app walks you through what you need to do. And there's something really interesting that happens when you do this. And I, I wake up an anxious. Like that's, part of, that's part of who I am. I wake up anxious. And this kind of recenters re myself. It kind of eliminates that added stress and anxiety that I'm going to be carrying when I wake up in the morning, thinking about the rest of the day. So that by the time you're done with those 10 minutes, and you drink that first cup of coffee, you're ready to go. You've kind of deposited that stress, and you just left it there. And we're talking about 10 minutes of your morning. And it take, it, it's harder to get started, but once you do, once you do that first maybe two or three sessions, you're going you're gonna to start 
integrating it into your lifestyle. So I feel obligated to put this one in. I don't do it, so I'm not going to be a hypocrite and tell you to go work out. Um, this is my fiance's Fitbit. And she's someone who, she, she doesn't know that I'm saying this, but she's someone that suffers from anxiety. Any person that is an internal medicine resident at a major hospital, if you're not suffering from anxiety, um, you're probably not a very good doctor because people's lives are in your hand, right? So, so her and her coworkers take the, use the Fitbit as a way to challenge themselves. And uh, Stacy goes to the gym uh, with a personal trainer. That's the only time she'll go. She needs that motivation. So she finds that exercise works for her. She won't meditate. She thinks I'm ridiculous. But I think she's ridiculous for exercising. So whatever. You pick your thing. But even if it's, even if it's a, oh, if you have an Apple Watch or, or whatever, or you set a timer for when to stand up from your desk and just walk around, just do something to get the blood circulating. These little things that you start adding into your schedule are putting the control back, back in, into yourself. Okay, we're rebooting our life. We're regimenting our schedules. You're not letting, it's not the Wild West anymore. When you're living in this, this uh, mental breakdown state, when you're living in this world of anxiety, it's the Wild West. You're just running around, you're not really sure where to go. There's shootouts, there's crazy things happening. You need to get away from that and start putting things in your life to practice control. Does anybody know Will Degas? Good friend of mine, awesome developer. He came up with this thing called the texting tree. What's cool about the texting tree is you text a phone number and the LED lights will change color based on the color that you text. Did it for fun. It was a hobby. It was a way for him just to get away from work, do something a little bit different. For me, I picked up guitar. It lasted two months, but I tried something different, something that didn't have to do with drawing dogs or building websites. So finding, finding that thing that you can do outside of your day-to-day -day job something that you can't monetize, something that you're in complete control of, that's, a, again, something essential for managing the situation. Volunteering. So this is me and my uh, ex-little. I'm in Big Brothers Big Sisters. I have a new little now. But he's over 18, so I can show this picture. <laughs> so he. So I, I, I've been in Big Brothers Big Sisters for I don't know how many years, five years. And it is a great way, not necessarily Big Brothers Big Sisters, but just volunteering in general to boost that dopamine and put you in a happy place. So whether maybe it's, it's volunteering at a, an animal shelter or doing a walk for cystic fibrosis or whatever it is, if you're someone that can't just sit around and do nothing, or you're not someone that wants to meditate or exercise, go find a volunteer oppor opportunity. You're going to fill the day, and you're going to feel great afterwards. All right, so the stigma of talking to a therapist. I don't care how mild your anxiety is. I don't care how mild your depression is. I used to say those things too when the doctor said, go talk to a therapist. Don't talk to your friends about your problems and expect to feel better overnight. You got to pay somebody. You're not going to go find a plumber off the street or your friends, brothers, uncles, cousins, whatever that will do your plumbing for free and then expect it to be perfect. Maybe you'll luck out and it will be. Sometimes it actually pays to, to pay somebody. 
And I found that even with the mildest anxiety, there are times when I, when I go to a therapist, you don't have to go every day or every week or every month even. There are times where I go and I have nothing to unload, or at least that's what I think. And we just shoot the shit, we just talk, him and I. And then I leave, and it's like I feel a little bit lighter. I don't know why, I didn't, I didn't say anything emotional, it didn't, it, wasn't, it didn't feel particularly impactful, but you just feel a little bit lighter. And I think that having that person that's completely objective is really important. Because if you talk to a friend, they're gonna become emotionally involved. And then suddenly they're gonna be like, hey, are you doing okay? Oh, that's the worst. You don't want that person to be constantly following up with you because all that's gonna do is stir up those emotions and remind you that you're suffering from anxiety and depression. So having this, again, scheduled appointment with somebody and you say, okay, on Friday or Thursday or whatever day, I'm going to go, I'm gonna spend 60 minutes just unloading my baggage and then I'm gonna leave, is crucial. So let's just recap. If you determine to create a hobby or side project, understand what that's going to be. Set up your rules, set up your understanding of the parameters. If you want to grow it into a business, what does that mean? Do you have to come up with a business plan now? Might not be a bad idea. Kind of learned that with Charity Pups, that I probably should have done that. I made some assumptions. Don't make assumptions. What happens when you make assumptions? You end up up here talking about managing a mental breakdown. <laughs> so don't make assumptions about your project. And if you're already in a state of anxiety, maybe it's time to reboot your life. Okay, we talked about some really great ways to do that. But most importantly, change your mindset. Stop planning for projects to fail and start planning for them to succeed. Because sometimes just discovering who you are throughout that project is success in itself. Thank you. Any questions? What's that? <laughs> I get that a lot. So actually that's a really, I'm glad you asked that and I took it out of the presentation um, just because I, I thought it would derail things. But uh, currently I've re in rebooting my life, I've rebooted Charity Pups and I've changed the way I do things. So I no longer sign the prints. No one noticed. And because I don't sign the prints, I can send them to a print shop and fulfillment shop. And now I don't have to go to the United States Postal Service anymore. Thank God. But because I've taken that workload off, it's, it's a little bit easier to draw the dogs. Also, I realized my strengths and weaknesses. I was really good at posting pictures of the dogs when I had lots of free time. And I was... A, decent at kind of like coding the site to look pretty. But I realized that if I wanted to make this sustainable, if I wanted to continue Charity Pups, because I had two choices. I could say, I'm done with Charity Pups and completely shut it down. Or I could actually plan for success and turn it into a sustainable business. And so I met with two people, someone who's a marketing guru 
and someone who's an awesome web developer, and I said, would you be my partners in this? And they said yes. So now I've taken components that were stressful to me and removed those. Not only that, is I'm teaching other people how to draw in my style. So I don't have to be the only one drawing the dog. So do I hate drawing dogs? No. Is it my favorite thing in the world? Not really. But I'm starting to feel the appreciation. And once I start getting back out there and seeing the fandom occur again, that's going to reinvigorate me. It's just going to take some time. And it's part of the process. Great question. Yes? Great question. So it's funny because I'm, I'm, a, I'm super extroverted. My friends had no idea that I was anxious. Uh, only one person that I know that knew me for many, 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 many years knew that was something was wrong when I was hanging out with them. But in a lot of instances, you're not going to know unless you look for a few things. One, is that person working on a really a big project that they're spending a lot of hours? Are they starting to flake out on you? Are they starting to make excuses as to why they can't do something? Are they starting to become a recluse? If you're starting to notice that people are exhibiting patterns or trends that could be related to anxiety or them being depressed, it might be time to, to step in, but you can't do it in a shotgun approach, right? can't just have a, a meeting of friends and ambush them. You have to do it in a tactful way. Take them out for, you know, take them out for a drink or take them out for dinner. You say, how's everything going? It's up to them to bring it up to you. But use this presentation as a potential tool to engage those people. Say, Oh, you know, I was, I was at Stir Track and I heard this really amazing presentation, and it was probably the most adorable presentation I've ever seen. And it was all about managing like anxiety and depression. Um, and I learned these tips and just kind of tease it out of them. It's up to them, though, for the, if, to, if they're going to, to open up or not. But you can do your part by just being there and offering, you know, to be a sounding board without being so upfront about it. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yes, up top. Uh, I've had dogs with one eye. I've had dogs in wheelchairs. I've had, um, I, no. Every dog I draw is adorable. I'll tell you why. It's a simple trick. I make their heads really big. And their eyes big. <laughs> big head, big eyes, adorable. Yes? Yeah, so I would get a lot of, a lot of people submit their dogs uh, that have recently passed away or are uh, going to pass away or they're going to have to put down. And it didn't impact me emotionally toward the end. I became desensitized to it. I would still uh, empathize with them because I did have a dog growing up that we had to put down, but I didn't, I didn't let it. You know, it's like my fiance is a internal medicine resident. People die, and as a doctor, you become unfortunately desensitized to people dying. I mean, that's part of life, right? And so part of drawing dogs is dealing with people that are going to commission you to draw their dog that has a tumor or their dog that just recently passed away. And I would get a lot of really interesting stories from people, um, but I think the stories that actually would impact me the most were the follow-ups. 
the I gave this as a gift, and this was the reaction. They cried when they saw the illustration. Though that's what hit me the most, but in a positive way, not in a feeding my anxiety kind of way. Now, granted, I say that, but again, when I'm spiraling down and I say that this project is failing, that's in direct relation to I don't want to let my fans down. And those are the people that are emailing me and asking me or telling me these stories. So now I feel like I'm letting those people down. So it does, in, in a weird kind of way, eventually impact me, but not in the moment. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, uh, it did. I hated, um, I hated design for a while, just in general. Uh, because I was eating terrible, I wasn't sleeping. So how could you possibly be motivated to do your day-to-day -day job when you're constantly dealing with the stress of what you're going to have to do at 5, 6 o'clock at night for the rest of the night? So yeah, it does impact, and it impacts your relationships with people. That's actually sometimes even worse. Is your friends, family, those closest to you, it impacts, it's, it's a bomb that goes off and the collateral damage is those around you, including yourself. So yes, it does, it does hurt everyone around you and yourself and all of the activities that you are involved in. Yes. Yeah, so um, it's like it's about pivoting, right? So I talked about what I what I plan to do with uh, with charity pups now in the future, but if I had thought about charity pups and created a business plan, which I should have done when I pivoted originally, that would have kept the interest going. It's always about thinking about the next thing. So yeah, there are times when a project can become stagnant. But if that's the way you designed your project, great. You're not going to suffer from anxiety because you're saying there is an endpoint. But if you don't have that endpoint ever established, if you've never defined what success means or what failure means or what it means to complete a project, you're in danger of running into that point where you start to think, oh, I'm letting this project fail, and then I'm a failure. So yes, it is possible for projects to fizzle out. But make sure that you understand and are in control of that so that you don't let it happen to you versus you letting it happen to the project. Anyone else? All right. Thank you.